Amen. Mm. How many ready for God's word this morning? Amen. Let's dive into it. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Let's read this together. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. You ask wrongly that you may spend it on your pleasures. I love how strong the language of James is. He writes, he says, adulterers, adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If you'd like my notes this morning, you text notes to the numbers on the screen. What's in front of me will be sent to you. I've entitled my message this morning this, the win the war within. Win the war within. Let's pray. Let's ask as we open God's word uh, for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. This morning, Holy Spirit, we come before you today. We come humbly, Father. God, I ask that, Lord, you would speak through your word today, Jesus, that, Lord, it wouldn't just be uh, words that we read, but, God, we would be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, and it would be alive in our hearts, oh, God. Lord, you would take your logos word, your written word, and make it rhema, make it alive in us, Jesus. Lord, I I ask that God, that Lord, uh, as your word says, it's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path, that God, it would illuminate our path ahead, Father. Lord, would you speak to us this morning, God? We don't make room for you, as we often pray, God, but we give you the room this morning, Jesus. We love you, we love you, we love you. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said in this place, Amen, amen, amen. Crazy story. When I was about 18 years old, 18, 19 years old, I was driving to go meet someone to play tennis. Now, when I was driving, I often, as an 18, 19-year-old, I didn't pay attention to uh, the speed limit, and so I was probably going about 15 miles over, sadly. I was young and foolish. Some of you might have been there before. And I got stopped for speeding. Now, I wasn't the first time I got stopped for speeding, being young and foolish and not paying attention. And so I get pulled over, and the cop asks me for my license registration. So I give him my license registration. He comes back to the car, and he says, young man, get out of the car. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is a little different than what's happened before. And so I get out of the car, and the next thing I know is he throws me against the hood. (laughs) And he puts handcuffs on me and starts reading me my rights. And I'm thinking to myself, what is going on? And I just start bawling, crying. I don't know what is happening in this moment. Now, go back a little bit. Now, I had gotten stopped for a seatbelt ticket about 18 months before this, okay? Up in North Carolina, we lived in South Carolina in Spartanburg at the time. And so I was coming back from Thanksgiving vacation with my family, and I got the seatbelt ticket, and I paid the fine, but then I paid the fine, and it got there late in North Carolina. I foolishly waited the last minute as a procrastinator that I was when I was 18, 19, and the fine got there, the the payment got there, but it got there late. And so my parents also moved uh, at that time, and so I didn't get any notices in the mail saying that my payment got there late and that my license was suspended. And so I had no idea I was driving on suspended license. All right, so I'm driving on suspended license. I have no idea what is happening. And so when the cop stops me for speeding that day, 
It shows that my license suspended. I had no idea that my license was suspended. And so therefore, he then throws me into jail. Like I go and I spend time in the Tryon County Jail in North Carolina. And then he transports me from the Tryon County Jail to Spartanburg County. So Tryon's in North Carolina. He transfers me to Spartanburg County Jail. And uh, where my warrant for my arrest is out. I had a, yes, I had a warrant uh, out to arrest me. And uh, they put me in uh, orange flip-flops and a blue jumpsuit. I remember that day. Uh, I'm eating a ham and turkey sandwich that they give me uh, in jail, and I'm sitting next to two guys, and they're asking me, why are you in here? And I'm like, I'm in here for a seatbelt ticket that I paid late. <laughs> and they say all kinds of things like, that's, you know, I'm not going to repeat it. And uh, I asked them, so what you in here for? And they're like, well, I was in here for drunk driving last night. And the other guy next to me, he had sadly beaten his wife the night before. And I'm sitting here thinking, why in the world am I here right now? Now, what's crazy about this story is my one phone call I give, and I, and I, I give to a friend because uh, I know they're going to answer the phone. And then uh, she then calls my parents and tells them, well, uh, Adam's in jail right now. My parents had planned to go hiking that day, and they still continued on with their plans because they want to teach me a lesson. <laughs> and so they're hiking in the Appalachian Mountains thinking I did something really, really wrong. And so I spend all day in jail, and they finally come to bail me out, thankfully. And they find out why I'm there. And my dad's a little bit upset because here I am, 18, 19 years old, and I'm thrown into jail. And it's probably a really great thing because I learned some lessons that day uh, for it. And they kept me there because they were thinking I did something crazy wrong. Now, the next day, I go and I lead worship for our kids' ministry at the church I served at. And I also uh, lead small group for all of the youth uh, as well that morning, which is kind of crazy that I was in jail the day before and still got to serve in church and all of that. I learned two really uh, valuable lessons that day, and one is this, was to respect the law. Like, like now, I, I, I've learned my lesson, I, I don't speed uh, anymore because uh, I, I, I'm afraid of being going back to jail. Um, the second lesson I learned is to not judge other people and why uh, they are in the circumstances they are in, because you have absolutely no idea right? Don't judge other people. I learned that really, really valuable lesson that day. And James is saying here in chapter 4 that oftentimes what ends up happening is we'll judge other people, judge them for their circumstances. But the reason why we're really judging other people is to make ourselves feel better because there's inner turmoil and there's this war within all of us. There's this battle within all of us. And, said, and so instead of looking inward at ourselves, we'll choose to look outwardly and we'll judge other people. And this is what causes conflict. Now remember, James is writing to believers here, okay? He's writing to believers. He's writing and saying, why is there this conflict? Why is this, this war among you? He's saying because something inside of you is not quite right. There is this void inside of you. There is this deep uh, place of insecurity, of pain, you name it, inside of you. And you're looking to all of these other things to fulfill you, but the only thing that can fulfill you is Jesus Christ. What really happens and why there's conflict among believers is because ultimately we're not grounded in, the, grounded in our identity in the Lord. We don't truly know who we are and whose we are in God, and so we'll look at other people and blame them instead of just saying, okay, God, you're my measure for success. God, Lord, I want to please you and you alone. God, I'm not trying to uh, look at other people and compare my life to them. Lord, I just want you. The foundation of it and the root of our identity really is where is your approval coming from? Is it coming from the Lord? Is it coming from him and him alone? And so this morning what I want to do is I'm going to give you four things from the book of James here in James chapter 4 to win this war, to win this battle within. The first thing is this. Conflict derives from unmet desires. 
The conflict within the body of Christ derives from these unmet desires. James says it this way, and he asked this question again, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. So James is asking, what is causing all of this fight among you? He explains it is because this inner conflict. There's something inside of you that is lacking. You are not fulfilled. So what ends up happening is you, you crave more. You desire more. You covet. You want to prove yourself. And so James is saying that you'll go as far as murdering someone. Now, I don't think anyone in this room is actually going to kill someone because of this. But what it might end up happening is you'll murder their reputation because you think that it will make you feel better on the inside and fulfill this pain and this hurt inside of you and to bring you peace. But all along what ends up happening is you have a bigger void inside of you. And so this void inside of you then leads to frustration. And so this inner conflict leads then to this external conflict and this frustration. So then you'll look to other people to fulfill this void inside of you, right? And so you'll look at your spouse and say, man, you're not the person I married. Man, why aren't you fulfilling my needs? Why aren't you doing this? I'm looking to you and I'm asking you to do more for me because you're not fulfilling this void inside of me all along, not realizing the only person that can fulfill this void is who? It is Jesus, right? It's only Jesus that can fulfill this void. And so you cause all this external conflict, not realizing that there's this conflict within you, and it's not being fulfilled because you're not going to Jesus to fulfill this void. This is what James is talking about. You're not going to Jesus to fill this void. There's not a pastor, not a spouse, not a person, not a ministry, not a thing in this world that can fulfill this void inside of all of us except for who? Except for Jesus. It is only him. And so the question that you have to often ask yourself to really see, man, where am I at in all of this, right? How do you examine your heart with this? Is what is my motivation in life? What's my motivation? Am I motivated by outdoing someone else? Am I motivated to get more stuff because then I'll have a bigger house than that person? I have a nicer car than that person? Am I motivated because then I will have a title? What is my motivation in life? What is your motivation of why you do what you do? That's going to tell you where you're at in this, in this eternal, this uh, internal conflict within you and this war within you. What is your motivation? Because if your motivation is anything other than Jesus, what's happening? You're missing the point entirely. Our motivation has to be just to, I want to please God. I want to bring glory to God, not my own self, not so I look good, not so that other people see that I have a bigger house or a nicer car or all of this external worldly stuff. It has to be, Lord, I just want to please you and you alone. That has to be the foundation of your motivation. What is your motivation? If our motivation is fueled by envy for what others have or have achieved or a desire for a title, then our efforts are in vain and meaningless. I love how Solomon puts it in Ecclesiastes. He says it this way. Then I observe that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. That's pretty crazy truth, isn't it? Most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. But he says this too is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Listen, when we are envious and have unmet desires for what others possess and those desires become a driving force behind our efforts in life, this divisive spirit to outdo them and obtain what they have leads to this external conflict. 
And we don't even oftentimes realize what is happening and going on, do we? So we pray and we ask God, this is the crazy part, we pray and we ask God to bless us, not realizing that we're doing it from an unpure heart. Because we're wanting other people, we're asking God to bless us, we're wanting people to see the blessing upon our life. Which leads to the second thing that you must know from James 4 to win this war within. Number two, the danger of praying wrongly. There's a danger of praying wrongly. James 4 verse 2 says this, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. <laughs> You're asking the Lord for stuff because you might spend it on your own pleasures. I don't know about you, but I've been there before. I think we're all guilty of this at a particular moment in time in our life. I am certainly guilty of it. Did you know that there's a right way to pray and a wrong way to pray? Prayer is not about convincing God to give you what you desire and what you want. Prayer is about us aligning our hearts with the heart of God. What does God want? What is his will? What is his desire for me? And many of us in this room, we have unanswered prayer because we're asking the Lord for stuff. We're asking the Lord for things that are outside of his will. And so we have unanswered prayer because we're not asking the will of God. The right way to pray is, Lord, I want your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, would you help me to have a deeper relationship with you? God, would you guard me from all this external stuff? Would you guard me from uh, de desiring the things of this world? Lord, would you purify my heart? God, would you help me to keep in line with you? Lord, I want a deeper relationship with you. God, I just want whatever you have for me in this life. And what ends up happening is all the other stuff that we kind of want, I believe that God just provides for every need and blesses us. Because when you realize, okay, I mean, God's everything that I need. What does the Bible say? You don't have to worry about tomorrow for tomorrow's going to take care of itself, right? There's a right way to pray and a wrong way to pray. The wrong way to pray is God. I, I want a bigger house. God, I want a nicer car. God, would you give me this? God, would you give me this? God, I want this. I want this. I want this. And meanwhile, you're feeling more and more empty inside as you get. When is enough enough, right? When is enough enough? Because none of those things can satisfy this desire inside of us except for the Lord. Him and him alone can satisfy us. There's a right way to pray. There's a wrong way to pray. And then James uses this very, very strong language when he says this. He says, adulterers and adulteresses. What's crazy about this, just think for a moment. We, we go to God asking him for stuff when he alone is the one that can satisfy us. And that's why James is saying adulterers, adulteresses, very strong language, is because we're going to the one who has perfect love, the only one who can truly satisfy us, the one that can bring meaning and purpose in our life, and we're asking him for all this external stuff. And that's why James is saying, adulterers, adulteresses. Like we're literally going to the one who can satisfy, asking him to satisfy us with other stuff. We're all guilty of this. You know, one of the dangers in this walk with the Lord is that we will find other people to then uh, bring satisfaction to the reason why we want to sin. We'll, we'll find other pastors, preachers, other things that will uh, help us to say, it's okay of why I'm doing what I'm doing and I want to live this way. You follow me? Here's what Christians do. We will... We'll make ourselves feel better by pursuing worldly things. We try to find a pastor or teacher to support biblically what we want to do. And so we'll find a false teacher that will take scripture out of context to justify our sin. 
We do this so that it will affirm our spiritual rebellion, because that's what it is. It's spiritual rebellion. So listen, if you want to believe that you can be a Christian and practice homosexuality, you can find a false affirming pastor to join along with you. If you want to be a racist and call yourself Christian, you can find a pastor that promotes skin color over kingdom citizenship. If you want to be a Christian and believe that abortion is acceptable to God, you can find a false preacher to justify murder. I want to say, man, vote no on Amendment 4. Amen? If you want to shack up outside of marriage, not only can you find some false teachers, but you can find some married preachers that are doing it themselves. And that is why their church is struggling with sexual immorality. If you want to find a rebellious stance and call a Christian... You can find a pastor to affirm you. So do not tell me, you know, Adam, I found something on tithe, and so therefore I don't have to tithe anymore. You know, you can find a rebellious stance in any area of life, and you can find an antichrist spirit to partner with. This is why James uses this very strong language, adulterer, adulteresses. Because you're literally cheating on God. And letting something other than the Lord fulfill you. Now I just want to say to you this morning this. Man, if you've struggled with any of this, if you've had an abortion, if you've uh, walked in sin before, any of that stuff. Man, there is grace upon grace upon grace upon grace every single morning. And God forgives you. God forgives you. We're going to get to, and I love this book because in verse 6 there, it talks about the grace. We're going to get to grace here in a moment. There's grace for all of this. There's grace for our sin. There's grace where we fall short, and we've all fallen short. Here's the next thing that I want to cover from, from James is God is jealous for you. God is jealous for you. And so knowing how God is jealous for for us, it should really, what, change our perspective on how we follow the Lord. Look at verse 4 here. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God? Or do you think that the scripture says in vain the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? God is jealous for you. Our relationship with God is exclusive. We can't ride the fence. We can't have one foot in the world and one foot following the Lord. Our relationship with the Lord is exclusive. God, he makes a covenant with Israel. And he, he says this in this covenant. He says, I'm the Lord God and there will be no other gods before me for I am a, what a jealous God. He makes that underneath the old covenant, but then in the new covenant, what does he do? He gives us the spirit of God, the spirit of God comes and lives inside of us as a new creation. And so here in James, it says what? It says that the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. The word yearns means to desire greatly or to crave. And so when you think about this, the spirit of God, God He desires you. He craves you. He craves relationship with you. He craves this authentic, real relationship where you can have this this conversation with him and be real with him and share your struggles, share your pain, and share all this with him. And how we respond to God and his jealousy, jealous for us, is vitally important. Because James says this, do you not understand that once you start pursuing these other things in life, that James is saying that you're an enemy of God? And it's not that we're saying that God is our enemy, it's that God is saying about us, if we're pursuing other things in this life, that we are his enemy. Strong language from James. James. That we're his enemy. I don't know about you, but man, that shakes me to my core. To think that when we desire things of this world, that we're the enemy of God. But this is the beautiful part of this passage. You can't leave this part out, which leads to 
Uh, number four this morning is that grace abounds where humility is found. So he calls you, this very strong language, adulterers, adulteresses. He says you're an enemy of God. But he uh, puts this section as saying, but he gives more grace. Grace abounds where humility is found. Verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. Let's, let's start here with this phrase. But he gives more grace. This is a reminder that God's grace is not just a one-time offering, but is continually available even the face of our failures and our shortcomings is an open invitation for those who feel they've messed up, for those who feel they've missed the mark, for those who have outright even just rejected God in their life. There is grace, and there's grace that God extends to us. There's grace, grace, and more grace. This grace extends beyond human understanding. This grace is more than enough even when we don't deserve it. None of us in this room deserves the grace of God, but yet he gives it freely like the grace of God is running after us, is pursuing us, is recklessly coming after us, and he gives and extends grace because he wants his relationship with you and reconciliation with you. Perhaps you've spent your life pursuing all of these other things, pursuing worldly things to satisfy you. Perhaps you've spent your life I'm trying to find a way in a relationship uh, to, pers- to, to, to pursue, to bring comfort and peace inwardly for this battle which is inside of you. Perhaps you've pursued all these other stuff to satisfy you. There's grace. There's grace. There's grace. And I love what comes next. There's more grace. God gives grace to the humble but he resists the proud. And this this phrase is also found in in Proverbs that James is repeating and writing here. Uh, God gives uh, grace to the humble, but resists the proud. It's a phrase that's found in Proverbs, but it's also a phrase that uh, Peter uh, writes and refers to in 1 Peter chapter 5. In 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, and I I love it, right before that, he says, close yourself in humility. Clothe yourself in humility, meaning humility is something that we actually put on. Humility is something that we choose. It's not inside of any one of us to be humble, but we have to choose to be humble, to clothe ourselves with humility. Because here's where the rubber meets the road, that if God gives grace to the humble and he resists the proud, I don't know about you, but I don't want resistance from God, the creator of the universe. I don't want this barrier between myself and the Lord. May we walk humbly before God. May we humble ourselves before him. And for you in this room right now, if you come before the Lord and say, man, I've messed up, I pursue the things of this world, I've chased after other stuff, I've judged other people, and it's led to this external conflict in my life, and all of these other things, there is grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. All your sin is covered over because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for you on Calvary. All you simply have to do is, God, I've messed up. God, I've sinned, and come before him, and his grace is more than enough. And I love that. It says, more grace, right? More grace, meaning no matter what you've done, there's more grace for it. There's more grace. There's grace upon grace upon grace. You can't, out, you can't, you can't sin enough to cause God to resist you. Only thing you have to do is come and humble yourself, and God forgives you. He forgives you. It's beautiful and it's wonderful what Calvary meant for us and what Jesus did for us on the cross and how his grace is sufficient for us. And so I ask you this morning to receive the grace of God. How do you win this war within? You come humbly before the Lord and say, God, I just want you. Forgive me for the times that I've tried to search after this world 
and I've done things, God, to separate myself from you. And Lord, I just want you. So maybe you're here today and you've gone through some stuff, you've done some stuff, you've fallen short. Man, I've fallen short. I've messed up over and over again in my life. I'm thankful that God's grace is more than enough. Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning?